Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I'll show you a horror TV series named Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins the night right before the arrest of a serial murderer, Jeffrey Dahmer. As usual, he was cleaning the tools he used for his murder. The smell of blood and rotting flesh filled the air, spreading through the vents to his neighbor's apartment. Unable to bear the stench any longer, the neighbor confronted Jeffrey just as he was leaving his apartment. Jeffrey quickly explained that his freezer had broken down, causing the pork inside to spoil. But the neighbor pointed out to him that he had said he threw it out last week. Realizing his mistake, Jeffrey changed his story, claiming that the fish in his aquarium had died and he would take care of it the next day. With that, he left the apartment building. Soon after, Jeffrey arrived at his favorite gay bar, a place he frequented. It satisfied his unique needs and allowed him to scope out his next victim. Once again, he employed the same tactic, offering a man some dollars to come to his apartment to take some special photos. The man, referred to as Ronald, accepted the offer. As soon as they entered the apartment, Ronald noticed the pungent smell. Jeffrey explained that the rotten smell came from spoiled pork in the broken freezer. He then locked the door with a latch. This made Ronald cautious, wondering why the windows and doors needed to be tightly shut just for taking photos. Instead of explaining further, Jeffrey began pouring beer, secretly adding a sedative to one of the cups. This trick had always worked in the past, but Ronald was on high alert this time and noticed the white powder in the cup. Even though Jeffrey finished his drink, Ronald only took a sip and insisted on leaving due to the unbearable smell. Jeffrey blocked the doorway, suggesting they go to the bedroom for some fresh air. Ronald reluctantly followed Jeffrey into the room. As they passed by the fish tank, Jeffrey mentioned that one of the fish had died. While Ronald was looking around, Jeffrey suddenly pulled out a pair of handcuffs. Fortunately, Ronald reacted quickly and only one hand was cuffed. He angrily shouted and turned to leave. Jeffrey tried to stop him, grabbing a dagger from the table. Ronald was terrified and cooperated fully, following Jeffrey to the bedroom. To his surprise, the smell was even worse in the bedroom, and there was a dried blood stain on the bed. Ronald finally realized he had entered a butcher house, and that his life was in danger. However, Jeffrey didn't attack him. Instead, he asked Ronald to sit down and watch a Daniel C.C. horror movie with him, claiming he had been lonely for too long. But Ronald was in no mood to watch a movie. He was trembling in fear and kept glancing at the barrel, wondering what was inside. Out of survival instinct, Ronald started to comfort Jeffrey's lonely soul. The plan worked, and Jeffrey soon put down his dagger. Seizing the opportunity, Ronald showcased his skills with a seductive TikTok dance. Jeffrey was indeed taken by the performance, even taking out a camera to capture the beautiful moment. After taking some photos, Jeffrey forced Ronald back onto the bed. Ronald began to cooperate willingly. While Jeffrey was immersed in the moment, Ronald suddenly used his strength to break free, attempting to run for help. To his dismay, the front door had several locks. Jeffrey caught up with him quickly, but Ronald managed to knock Jeffrey down again. This time, he successfully unlocked the door and escaped. Unexpectedly, Jeffrey didn't attempt to flee when his cover was blown, as he had experienced similar situations before and always managed to get away with it. Alternatively, he may have simply grown tired of his current life and wanted it to bring it to an end. Before long, Ronald returned with two police officers. Jeffrey calmly claimed that both he and Ronald were gay and had only been playing a game. However, this time he couldn't talk his way out of it as Ronald was wearing handcuffs and the police needed the key. Jeffrey had no choice but to open the door and let the police in. The strange smell in the apartment was explained away with the same excuse. The two officers were surprisingly nonchalant, not even questioning the bloodstains on the bed. Upon Jeffrey's guidance, they went straight to the bedside table to search for the handcuff key. However, the stack of photos in the drawer quickly caught the officer's attention. Among them were several images of dismembered victims. Jeffrey tried to escape, but the police immediately caught him. After the search, the police found freshly severed heads and hearts were stored in the refrigerator, while five bleached skulls were hidden under his bed. Shockingly, a wooden barrel filled with an acidic solution containing three human torsos was found in the corner of the room and some residues were discovered on the dining utensils. Jeffrey's father was called in overnight to inquire about his son's situation, wondering if Jeffrey might have had any mental illnesses. At first, when the father heard that his son had committed a crime, he appeared calm. He mentioned that when Jeffrey was four years old, he underwent surgery for a hernia and seemed to change completely afterward, possibly due to brain damage caused by excessive anesthesia. 
Additionally, Jeffrey's parents divorced when he was 18, which might have been a significant blow to him. However, when the police revealed their findings from Jeffrey's apartment, the father could no longer maintain his composure. He never imagined that his son would have killed 17 people, and he felt a deep sense of guilt. Jeffrey's descent into such a state was inextricably linked to his father's failings. Jeffrey himself had already admitted to all murder charges. The police were also curious about how he had transformed into a murderous monster. Jeffrey didn't hold anything back and began to describe his childhood experiences. In his memory, his father and mother were engaged in endless arguments. His mother suffered from severe depression due to her pregnancy and fell into shock several times because of an overdose of medication, leaving her with no time to care for Jeffrey. His father was always busy with work and Jeffrey became quiet and even a bit peculiar in his behavior. His classmates kept their distance out of respect and Jeffrey's only pleasure was dissecting the bodies of animals that had died in the family warehouse with his father. Only then would his father spend more time with him. Although his father felt uneasy about his son's peculiar hobby, he continued to indulge him, thinking it would make his introverted son happy. However, as time went on, Jeffrey found himself increasingly attracted to animal innards, as they were the only things that could always be by his side. His father was busy with work, and his mother's depression only worsened after giving birth to his younger brother. Whenever his father came home, there would be loud arguments, which led him to subconsciously keep his distance from all women. What's worse, throughout all these years, Jeffrey never had a real friend at school. One afternoon when Jeffrey turned 18, his father told him that he and his mother were getting divorced. His younger brother's custody was awarded to his mother, and his father decided to leave the house to his mother and the two children while he moved out. Jeffrey was reluctant to part with his father, who had spent the most time with him. Unexpectedly, on the third day after his father moved out, his mother also prepared to leave with his younger brother. Jeffrey thought his mother would take him along, but she only cared about her younger son and had no regard for Jeffrey. Afterward, his mother started the car, taking the younger son away, leaving Jeffrey alone in the house. By this time, Jeffrey had become completely detached from the community. He found going to school dull and uninteresting. Once, after openly drinking alcohol in class, he was called to the principal's office. When his homeroom teacher asked him what his biggest dream was, the boy pondered before saying that not everyone has a dream. Little did he know that his life would take a turn that very afternoon. On his way home from school, a jogging guy stopped his car, wanting a ride to the town to watch a band performance. Jeffrey was thrilled. He had long admired the sweaty jogger he saw every day on his way to school. With time to spare before the band's performance, he made an excuse to stop by his house first to pick up a few things before driving to town. And so, Jeffrey brought the guy back to his home, where he would commit the first murder on his killing journey. After inviting the boy to his home, Jeffrey had the happiest time in years. However, the guy was still eager to go to the town to watch the band perform, and Jeffrey's excuses to stall for time were in vain. Watching him insist on leaving, Jeffrey was filled with inexplicable anger. In a rage, Jeffrey lifted a dumbbell and struck the boy, causing him to lose consciousness. Seeing the boy still struggling, Jeffrey choked the boy's neck until he stopped moving, saying that now he won't leave him this way. When Jeffrey regained his senses, he realized that the boy had stopped breathing. Regret and fear filled him, as he had never intended to kill a boy. However, his childhood experience with animal carcasses allowed Jeffrey to calm down. He knew he had to dispose of the body as soon as possible. The first place he thought of hiding the body was the drain in the backyard, but he realized that it was not a good idea, since the body would eventually be discovered if left on his property. The best way would be to dismember the body and make it disappear completely. With that in mind, Jeffrey dragged the body from the drain and took it to the warehouse he used for dissection. Before, he had only dissected animals, but now he faced a human being. In the end, Jeffrey couldn't bring himself to do it and decided to dump the body in the wilderness instead. However, on the way, he was stopped by a traffic police officer because his car was swerving. Panicking, Jeffrey tried to compose himself and lied that his parents had just divorced and he was out for a drive because he couldn't sleep at night. The police officer didn't raise his suspicion and only advised him to go home and sleep. Jeffrey narrowly escaped trouble, but his plan to dispose of the body failed. He had no choice but to return home and destroy the body in his own way. Blood was flushed directly into the toilet, while the bones were dried in the oven to remove moisture. They were then crushed into powder with a hammer, so that even if they were discarded in his own yard, no one would discover them. According to Jeffrey's own account, he was very nervous when he first dealt with the body. 
However, he gradually grew to enjoy the process, as it made him feel that those people hadn't left him. After his first murder, Jeffrey was not caught by the police, but he didn't plan to continue killing. Instead, he tried hard to restrain his inner feelings. Years later, Jeffrey graduated from high school, but he was still considered a freak by his classmates. Even in a graduation photo, Jeffrey's face was covered with a mosaic, which completely frustrated him. Just then, his father returned, accompanied by a new partner. The partner advised Jeffrey not to stay at home all day, which annoyed Jeffrey. He initially planned to share his feelings with his father, but found himself at a loss for words. When he managed to say that he had problems with his sexual orientation, his father interrupted him. His father changed the subject and promised to send Jeffrey to the best college. Just like in high school, Jeffrey continued to act bizarrely and was ostracized by all his classmates. Due to his heavy drinking, he hardly attended any classes during the semester. The principal personally declared that Jeffrey would be expelled. So his father decided to send Jeffrey to join the military. A year had passed after joining the military, and Jeffrey was given a chance to visit his family on vacation. He seemed like a completely different person, full of energy and vitality, having trained to become a battlefield medic. His father was relieved and praised him, saying he knew Jeffrey would succeed. What they didn't know was that Jeffrey chose to become a battlefield medic because he had learned of a drug formula that could induce unconsciousness. Becoming a medic in the army would allow him to legitimately obtain this drug, making it easier for him to satisfy his peculiar fetish. Soon, Jeffrey's actions were exposed and he was expelled from the military. His father lost all patience and sent Jeffrey to live with his grandmother. From then on, his life began a new chapter. His grandmother was actually a very kind person and initially showed great affection for her grandson. She even took out a wooden box filled with photos and awards from Jeffrey's father's childhood. These were all cherished memories. After looking through them, Jeffrey was deeply moved and asked his grandmother to give him the wooden box, as he also wanted to treasure some rare memories. Within a few days, Jeffrey found a job as a handyman at a nearby processed food shop. His grandmother believed that Jeffrey was a well-behaved child. However, one day, while cleaning Jeffrey's room, she discovered a male mannequin on his bed. It turned out that just two days prior, the food shop owner had instructed Jeffrey to wear a formal shirt to work. After work, Jeffrey went to the supermarket and came across the male mannequin. The strange urges in his heart flared up, and he secretly hid in the fitting room until the supermarket closed for the night. He then left the fitting room and stole the mannequin. Upon returning to his room, Jeffrey felt a long-lost sense of comfort from the mannequin and treated it as his other half. When he came home today, he found the mannequin missing and confronted his grandmother about the whereabouts of the item. In truth, when his grandmother discovered the mannequin, she suspected that Jeffrey had peculiar habits, so she decided to throw the mannequin away. Jeffrey was filled with anger and seemed like a different person, which frightened his grandmother for the first time. However, Jeffrey regained his senses and apologized to his grandmother. He lamented his loneliness and claimed that he treated the mannequin as his only friend. His grandmother advised Jeffrey to make new friends. The gathering taking place in the town the following evening would be an excellent opportunity for him to do so. On the following evening, Jeffrey went to the town gathering alone. However, the hustle and bustle seemed to form a net, completely isolating him. He tried to do something to attract attention, but all he got were strange looks from passersby. Jeffrey suddenly felt as if he were in a dream, even seeing the boy he had admired during high school. Consequently, he let loose at the fair. Unfortunately, his inappropriate behavior in public led to him being questioned by the police, and the food shop owner fired him as a result. Due to his experience as a battlefield medic, Jeffrey managed to find a job at a blood donation center. Little did he know, this place would satisfy his peculiar cravings once more. Jeffrey was like a monster, often taking advantage of his job to bring home blood bags and brazenly drink them in front of the mirror. However, this alone couldn't satisfy his desires. One evening, Jeffrey entered a gay bar for the first time, and its intense atmosphere opened up a new world for him. Afterwards, someone took him to a nearby bathhouse's private room, where they could do whatever they wanted to satisfy all kinds of desires. From then on, Jeffrey became a regular at the bathhouse. Moreover, he came up with a new trick, mixing his custom-made knockout drug into drinks, allowing him to do whatever he wanted in the bathhouse. Although Jeffrey didn't take anyone's life, he sometimes used too much of the drug, causing his partners to pass out. Eventually, after a near-fatal incident, the bathhouse owner could no longer tolerate it, and Jeffrey was added to their blacklist, banning him from entering their establishment. 
However, Jeffrey's peculiar desires did not disappear as a result. One day, after finding a new partner at the bar, he took them to a luxury hotel, claiming that the bathhouse environment was unpleasant. His new partner had no suspicions, and they quickly started to enjoy themselves in the hotel room. Jeffrey went to the bathroom to prepare his knockout concoction, putting the drug in a glass. However, his new partner suddenly burst into the bathroom, causing Jeffrey to panic and accidentally drink the drug beverage himself. Subsequently, he felt dizzy and disoriented. Staggering, he went to the bathroom to rinse his mouth, hoping to recover as soon as possible. He also managed to drug his partner again, this time successfully knocking them out. However, Jeffrey couldn't help but fall asleep as well. When Jeffrey woke up the next day, he found his new partner lying motionless on the bed. Panicked, he couldn't remember how he had killed the person the night before. But this was not the first time Jeffrey had encountered such a situation, so he had to find a way to handle it quickly. He bought a large suitcase from outside and stuffed the deceased person inside, then brought it back to his grandmother's house. The basement was a place his grandmother rarely visited. The following day, while his grandmother was at church, Jeffrey picked up his dissection tools once more. In no time, he had a severed head wrapped in plastic wrap and stored it in the old wooden box his grandmother had given him. In the following week, Jeffrey had to suppress his urge to kill. Then one day, Jeffrey saw the news of the death of a handsome male star, and his desires grew even stronger. Unable to resist, he rushed to the star's burial site with a shovel, wanting to embrace the corpse before it decomposed. Unfortunately, the ground was too hard, and he couldn't dig up the grave in a short time, so he had to give up. A few weeks passed, and the two people Jeffrey had previously killed surprisingly did not cause any stir, as if they had evaporated from the earth. This ignited his evil flame, and he couldn't help but return to his old ways. He would select targets at the bar, bring them back to his grandmother's house to drug them, and complete the killing in the basement to satisfy his fetish. As for why he had to kill them, Jeffrey later confessed that he believed corpses were the only things he could control in his life. However, the smell of decay soon caught his grandmother's attention. Fortunately, the basement stairs were too long for her to go down and investigate. But Jeffrey knew he had to dispose of the bodies quickly. He tried various methods to destroy the evidence, including heating, boiling, and acid corrosion. Finally, he would package the remains and throw them outside. Despite this, the basement still smelled of decay. So Jeffrey's grandmother called his father. As the father and son entered the basement, everything seemed normal on the surface. However, the father went straight to the corner workshop, forcing Jeffrey to unlock the door with his key. The father knew there was a workbench inside, which Jeffrey must have used for dissecting. The father then discovered a large amount of bloodstains around the drain, mixed with a pungent smell. Jeffrey explained that these were residues left after dissolving animal flesh with chemicals. His father was furious, thinking that his son shouldn't flush animal remains down the drain and ordered him to stop dissecting animals. Jeffrey obediently agreed. In fact, he was terrified. Including the three people killed at his grandmother's house, he had committed five murders in total. Each time he heard a police siren, he thought they were coming for him. However, they never were, and there were never any reports of missing persons on the news. Jeffrey grew more and more confident that as long as he was careful, he would never be caught. One day, Jeffrey happened to meet a handsome man on the street who was asking for help because his car had broken down. Jeffrey felt this was a good chance for him, so he went up to the man and lured him to his grandmother's house, claiming he would go back and get some tools. However, the man was highly vigilant and didn't want to follow Jeffrey to the basement. He kept insisting on leaving. Jeffrey tried to calm him down while offering him a cup of coffee, which the man drank, not realizing it was spiked. Just as Jeffrey was about to drag him to the basement, his grandmother suddenly appeared and asked what was wrong with the man. Jeffrey explained that his friend was drunk and he brought him back to sober up. However, his grandmother didn't think the man seemed drunk and decided to stay by his side in case any emergencies occurred. Jeffrey couldn't argue and had to let his grandmother do as she pleased. The next day, the man woke up from his deep sleep. Fearing the man would talk, Jeffrey offered to take him home. With his grandmother following, Jeffrey helped the man onto a bus, randomly gave an address to the driver, and managed to pass the grandmother's scrutiny. However, the incident didn't end there. The man remained in a drowsy state until he was kicked off by the driver at the last stop. Stumbling, he fainted again. When he woke up, he found himself in a hospital bed, having been rescued by a kind-hearted person. 
The first thing the man did after being discharged from the hospital was to go to the police station to file a report. He believed Jeffrey had attempted murder by drugging him. However, the investigating officer didn't take the accusation seriously. The man insisted, and the officer reluctantly confronted Jeffrey. Jeffrey, having dealt with the police before, remained calm this time. He explained that the man was drunk and wanted to drive home, so he brought him back to sober up. Since his grandmother appeared late and didn't witness the drugging, Jeffrey's explanation seemed reasonable. The officer accepted his story, believing Jeffrey had no criminal intent. However, the man became furious, accusing the officer of being more willing to believe a white man with a criminal record than a black man without one. He then stormed out of the police station, and this incident was brought to a hasty conclusion. However, Jeffrey didn't stop there. Soon, another incident occurred. This time, he failed to control the dosage of the drug, causing the victim to wake up halfway and escape. Jeffrey wanted to chase after him, but his grandmother was watching closely from the second floor, so he had no choice but to give up. The boy returned home and was noticed by his father that something was wrong. A few days later, Jeffrey was taken away by the police at the factory. But luck was on his side once again. Since the victim wasn't white, the judge was clearly biased towards Jeffrey, convicting him of second-degree assault and sentencing him to only one year in prison. The trial was hastily concluded. The victim's father looked at Jeffrey with a mix of anger and helplessness, while Jeffrey's father was disappointed in his son, deciding to make him move out after his release from prison because his grandmother couldn't handle his antics any longer. As they prepared dinner, Jeffrey kept complaining that he hadn't done anything wrong, claiming he only took some pictures. His father interrupted him and asked him to return his grandmother's wooden box of photographs. Jeffrey saw his father was determined and reluctantly went to his room. He brought the box out, but he didn't dare to open it as it contained a human skull. He made an excuse that he lost the key. Knowing his son was making up another excuse, his father angrily went downstairs to find a tool to unlock it. When he returned, Jeffrey said he found the key. Upon opening the wooden box, they discovered only a few adult magazines inside. It turned out that Jeffrey had already removed the skull. On the way back, the father was filled with guilt. He regretted not ending his unhappy marriage earlier, and many times Jeffrey had shown signs of psychological problems, but he hadn't looked into it further. Now, a grave mistake had been made, and someone else's child had been violated. He could never forget the victim's father's gaze when the trial ended. A year passed, and Jeffrey was finally released from prison. He seemed full of energy, and his father was delighted, hoping his son had changed after this. Jeffrey moved into a cheap apartment in the neighborhood. From then on, his life entered a new chapter. The area was chaotic and had lacked security, which was a paradise for criminals. To his father's surprise, Jeffrey was optimistic, and he kept his room tidy and well-organized. Jeffrey even mentioned that he had been promoted at work and was grateful that his father hadn't given up on him. The father then asked if his son had made friends. Tearfully, Jeffrey nodded, looking happy. It turned out that he had met a companion at a bar who almost changed his life. The man's name was Tommy. Although he was deaf and couldn't communicate normally with people, he was still full of passion for life. He had become a professional model through his own efforts and was kind to everyone. Even when facing someone as strange as Jeffrey, he treated him sincerely. This made Jeffrey feel an unprecedented warmth. For the first time, he resisted the urge to drug someone's drink. As the two grew closer, Jeffrey wanted to invite Tommy to his place several times, but was always rejected. However, Jeffrey always prepared for the day when Tony would visit his home. This was the reason for his tidy apartment. The father was relieved and encouraged his son to keep up the good work, telling him that life would become more colorful. That very night, Tony finally agreed to visit Jeffrey's place. Jeffrey still managed to resist the urge to drug Tony. It seemed that he had found his true love. The two of them spent a passionate night together. The next morning, Tony woke up shouting and checked the time, realizing he was going to be late for work. As Tony was about to leave, Jeffrey tried to stop him. Tony assured him that he would come back after work, but the shadows accumulated over the years re-emerged in Jeffrey's mind. His greatest fear was being abandoned, and only a corpse could be controlled by him. Jeffrey approached Tony, hiding a blood-stained hammer behind his back. Unaware of the danger, Tony gave Jeffrey a hug. Surprisingly, Jeffrey let Tony walk out of the room. The reality, however, was shocking. A few days later, Tony's mother went to the police station to report that her son had gone missing for several days. The police officer's response was formulaic, telling her the information had been recorded and to wait for news at home. 
Knowing that she could rely solely on the police, Tony's mother went to the streets to post notices for her missing son. She even asked residents to help search for her son. Jeffrey witnessed this scene with sadness, as if he could empathize with the pain of a mother losing her loved one. Upon returning to his apartment, Jeffrey felt heavy for the loss of his lover. Once he had somewhat settled, Jeffrey pulled out some ID cards from a drawer. These were the mementos he had deliberately kept after each murder. Flipping through them one by one, he surprisingly found Tony's ID card. Following the contact information on the card, Jeffrey casually made a call and told the person on the other end not to look for Tony anymore, as he was no longer alive. Just a few days prior, it turns out that Tony, who had just left, knocked on Jeffrey's door again because he had left his keys there. In the few minutes since Tony had left, Jeffrey had to suffer loneliness. He finally made up his mind to keep Tony by his side forever. Thus, the blood-stained hammer in his hand fell heavily. The next day, Jeffrey took a fresh heart from the fridge, cooked it, and began to feast on it. At that moment, he felt his heart connected to Tony's, completely merged and inseparable. In the days that followed, Jeffrey began his killing spree until the young African-American man Rommel managed to escape and call the police. The insane crimes were finally exposed. The 15 victims' ID cards collected by Jeffrey saved the police considerable time in identifying the victims. However, they now faced the difficult task of notifying the victims' families, which was a shocking tragedy for each household. In particular, there was an Asian family who had once accused Jeffrey in court of assaulting their third child. As a result, Jeffrey was sentenced to a year in prison. But shortly after his release, he killed the family's fourth child, who was only 14 years old. Fear and anger spread throughout the community where Jeffrey lived. Many people protested at his apartment and even more besieged the police station, criticizing the police's late response. If they had caught Jeffrey earlier, there wouldn't have been so many victims. Jeffrey's neighbor, Glenda, had called the police multiple times due to the stench and cries for help coming from Jeffrey's home, but all her calls had been ignored. Glenda had actually witnessed the 14-year-old Asian boy escape from Jeffrey's house and called the police. However, Jeffrey lied, claiming the boy was his drunk boyfriend. The two responding officers took the boy back to Jeffrey's apartment without even checking the child's age or name. As a result, the Asian boy suffered the most gruesome death. Later, when Glenda's interview made the news, no one from the police came forward to explain. Fortunately, a pastor confronted the police chief directly, claiming that the entire law enforcement system needed a thorough overhaul and the current racism had to be eliminated to reduce crime. The pastor then personally sought out Glenda to learn more about the unknown information, so Glenda recounted her painful experiences during that time. Living next to a serial killer, Glenda could smell the stench of something rotting. She went to complain, only to be fobbed off by Jeffrey with various excuses, such as a dead goldfish or a broken fridge. One day, a young man moved into the room upstairs. Glenda warned him to be cautious. The new neighbor had just stepped out into the hallway when he encountered Jeffrey, who struck up a conversation. That night, Glenda was awakened by screams coming from next door and immediately called the police. But the officer was very impatient, as this wasn't the first time Glenda had made such a call. They casually said they would send someone to check it out the next day. Speechless, Glenda knew that by the time they arrived, it would be too late. In the following weeks, Glenda never saw the new neighbor again while his mailbox overflowed with mail. Feeling something was off, Glenda approached the building manager to inquire about the tenant. The manager said the tenant had moved out and that he had no authority to just open the door. Still not giving up, Glenda invited the manager to her apartment to smell the odors emanating from Jeffrey's home, recommending that he evict Jeffrey from the building. The building manager finally took the advice and knocked on Jeffrey's door the next day, handing him an eviction notice. Due to numerous tenant complaints, Jeffrey was required to leave the apartment within a month. However, Jeffrey had just been fired that day and had no money to move elsewhere. The building manager could do nothing about it, leaving Jeffrey to find another solution. That afternoon, Jeffrey knocked on Glenda's door, asking her to withdraw the complaint. He admitted his mistake and even paid someone to clean his room. He wanted to enter Glenda's apartment to check if there were any lingering odors. When Jeffrey stepped inside, he pulled out a gift to apologize. It was a sandwich. He urged her to taste it, claiming it contained newly purchased pork. But Glenda dared not eat anything from him and insisted that no matter how attentive he was, she would not withdraw her complaint. At first, Jeffrey played the victim, but as he realized Glenda wouldn't budge, he turned cold. Regretting letting him in, Glenda asked him to leave. 
The atmosphere was tense, but luckily, Jeffrey finally left the room. Not long after, Jeffrey brought another victim home. In the middle of the night, Glenda heard a scream coming from next door. She grabbed the phone to call the police, suspecting someone had been harmed. But the police maintained a dismissive attitude and refused to come and investigate. Glenda was on the verge of a breakdown. The occasional screams from next door plunged her into endless fear. She decided to approach the vent to listen more closely, when suddenly, a smell of blood hit her. After hearing about Glenda's experiences, the church pastor promised to force the police to make some changes. Years of ignorance and discrimination made Glenda burst into tears. Subsequently, the pastor mourned the deceased with the community while criticizing the local security system. His actions received support and under pressure, the chief of police decided to reopen the investigation. However, only two police officers were held accountable for their severe dereliction of duty by sending the Asian boy to the murderer's home. The chief demanded their suspension, but the two officers adamantly made excuses. Eventually, the chief allowed them to take paid leave until the expert panel's investigation was concluded. The two officers were dissatisfied with the outcome and warned that their union wouldn't let it go. Within a few days, both officers returned to work. The mayor even called the pastor to say he was powerless due to the pressure of the police union. Reluctantly, the pastor vowed to fight another battle. To everyone's surprise, the security crackdown came to an abrupt end. Not only that, but the two reinstated officers were awarded the title of Best Officer of the Year by the police union. On the other hand, Glenda was awarded the honor of the citizen by the chief of police for her courage in exposing the truth. However, the sparse applause at her ceremony contrasted sharply with the officer's awards. When Glenda gave her speech, she implored the chief not to let similar cases happen again. The chief could only clap without making any promises. In truth, he was also helpless. Later, Jeffrey's father couldn't forgive his son's sick mentality and went to confront him in person. Jeffrey remained silent before bringing up the past when his father took him to pick up animal carcasses for dissections. However, the father scolded Jeffrey, refusing to take responsibility for his son's actions and insisting that he was a good father. The trial of the most vicious killer in history lasted for a large amount of time and attracted widespread attention due to the 15 murders committed by Jeffrey. The family sent their representatives to testify, believing that Jeffrey destroyed not only 15 lives, but also 15 happy families. All of them lived in constant pain and agony. Jeffrey was silent throughout the process, and it was unclear whether he was repentant or considering how to clear his name. Before the trial, Jeffrey's father had taken him to a lawyer for defense. However, the lawyer could only try to prove that Jeffrey was mentally ill. The lawyer was experienced and had prepared well, saying that there had been similar cases in history, where a ruthless killer had committed dozens of heinous crimes, and he applied for a not guilty defense, claiming that he was mentally ill. In the end, he spent the rest of his life in a hospital outside the prison. The father suggested that Jeffrey follow this method and claim that he did not remember anything when he killed the victims, or that there was another voice in his head driving him to do it. The lawyer would then try to prove to the judge that Jeffrey had a mental problem, giving him a chance to avoid prison. However, Jeffrey firmly stated in court that he was clear-headed when he killed the victims and that it was not out of hatred. He did it because he had contracted a strange disease, and after being diagnosed by a doctor, he had become calmer. He did not dare to hope for forgiveness, but he would do everything in his power to make amends to the families he had harmed. The judge then read the final verdict, sentencing Jeffrey to 15 life sentences. The families of all the victims breathed a sigh of relief, and it was one of the heaviest sentences in history. Jeffrey's father then saw Jeffrey's biological mother, who had been absent for many years. He believed that she had no right to be a mother after neglecting Jeffrey for so long. However, she exploded after hearing this, believing that Jeffrey's father was responsible for his son's actions because he had taken him to dissect animals in the past. The same thing was mentioned by Jeffrey before, which made his father start reflecting on his own actions. Initially, he believed that Jeffrey's mental problems were caused by his ex-wife taking too much medication during pregnancy. She never even held Jeffrey as a child and left him alone at home for three months. However, his current wife refuted this and asked him where he was during that time. The father began to reflect on his own actions. He believed that Jeffrey's mental illness inherited half of his own genes because he also had homicidal tendencies as a child. His wife comforted him and reminded him that their other child inherited half of his genes as well and turned out fine. This made his father feel much better. 
Before Jeffrey was sent to prison, the father found him again and sincerely admitted that everything was his fault. He should not have dissected animal corpses with Jeffrey. He realized that he was not a qualified father, especially during the times when Jeffrey needed his companionship the most. However, Jeffrey remained silent, but it was clear that he did not blame his father in the slightest. Jeffrey's biological mother is now also overwhelmed with self-blame. She even unplugs the gas pipe and starts writing a letter to Jeffrey as a last farewell, full of guilt in every line. She didn't take responsibility as a mother, even though she had secretly visited all the families of the victims before and asked them to speak up for Jeffrey in court. But this could not make up for her guilt. After sealing the envelope, she gradually passes out on the table. However, this terrifying serial killing case is not over yet. Every public media is reporting on it. A mysterious person who claims to be Jeffrey's friend even said on a variety show that Jeffrey had been beaten by his stepmother for years and even sexually assaulted by his father when he was a child. These unfounded allegations make Jeffrey's father so angry that he wants to smash the TV, so he decides to write an autobiography to prove to himself and Jeffrey that he is not to blame. However, he did not expect that his first article would receive widespread attention from the public, even earning accolades from the New York Times, and some people were even willing to buy the copyrights to make it into a movie. But the father did not get to enjoy this happiness for long. A lawyer informed him that the profits from the father's new book must be shared with the families of the victims due to their legal action. Moreover, Jeffrey only earns 25 cents per hour for his work in prison, and the surplus must also be divided among the families of the victims. What's worse, no one had anticipated that as the Jeffrey murder case spread widely, many young people would think that it was a cool thing to do. Many of them even became Jeffrey's fans and would express their admiration for him, along with a few dollars in donations. On the contrary, the victim's families often receive threatening or abusive letters and live in the shadow of Jeffrey even after he's been caught. The mother of the victim, Tony, consulted a lawyer for advice who suggested contacting other victims' families and continuing to sue Jeffrey and his family in order to intercept the profits from his father's book and Jeffrey's labor income in prison. This is another way of speaking out for justice, but even if the lawsuit succeeds, the victims' families' lives have not improved. Especially for this Asian family, the father named Southone often receives abusive phone calls asking them to go back where they came from. What's more, their young son is still plagued by nightmares after being sexually assaulted by Jeffrey. His mother spends her days in tears and even cuts out all the pictures of her deceased son to avoid triggering her emotions. Eventually, they couldn't take it anymore and even sued the local government. If not for the negligence of two police officers, their son would not have been killed. The compensation was finally settled out of court and South Oton's family received the compensation of $850,000. But that night, Southone received another abusive phone call asking him to take the money and leave the place. The neighbor of the murderer, Glenda, had to move back to her previous apartment after the investigation ended, although there was still a lingering smell in the room. She had no money to move to a better place. Every quiet night, Glenda would occasionally think of the terrifying murderer next door, making her impossible to sleep. She had to take her blanket and come to the hallway, where she found a group of people who had gathered due to their fear. One of the elderly ladies said that she would rather go up three floors than pass by the room where Jeffrey used to live. But the next morning, the door manager came to inform them, for safety reasons, sleeping in the hallway was no longer allowed. If they wanted to move out, they could terminate their leases for free, and those who stayed would receive a 25% rent reduction. But if these people could afford to move out, they wouldn't sleep in the hallway every day. When Glenda and her daughter passed by the apartment that night, they saw several young people imitating Jeffrey and taking crazy selfies. So the tenant stepped forward to stop them, feeling that this was disrespectful to the victims. However, those people argued that in public places, they had no right to interfere. Glenda's daughter was so angry that she grabbed the camera and smashed it on the ground. To Glenda's surprise, the police arrived unusually fast, and several officers took her daughter away for damaging someone else's property. As she watched the police car gradually drive away, Glenda was full of anger. On the other hand, the Asian father, Southone, received another abusive phone call from the two police officers, who had caused the death of his son due to negligence. Two months later, the authorities bought the apartment where Jeffrey had lived and chose to demolish it immediately. Glenda believed that this was not the best approach, as the deceased victims should not be forgotten. So she went to the city hall and suggested building a park or monument after the demolition to commemorate the victims who had lost their lives to Jeffrey. 
Jeffrey's personal belongings were also auctioned off by the government to support the victims' families. However, a local wealthy businessman bought them all because he was concerned about the impact Jeffrey had on the local image. Therefore, he chose to destroy all the items. With the passage of time, it is believed that Jeffrey's heinous crimes will gradually be forgotten by the public. With 15 life sentences in prison, Jeffrey became the target of jealousy among his fellow inmates. He received donations from fans every day, which he used to buy almost all the supplies he needed. Recently, he became obsessed with whale sounds and couldn't sleep without listening to them 10 or more times. However, to others, this sound was almost indistinguishable from the screams of his victims, and even the prison guards couldn't take it anymore, so they had to confiscate Jeffrey's tapes. His odd behavior did not end there. Jeffrey often did strange things in public, which made other inmates stay away from him. One day, when Jeffrey was praying in the prison chapel, a fanatic suddenly attacked him with a weapon, trying to stab him in the neck. He believed that Jeffrey was too arrogant and did not deserve to be in the church. Fortunately, Jeffrey survived without serious injury and recovered after a few days in the infirmary. Surprisingly, Jeffrey gained even more fans after this incident. Some even rumored that he was an immortal being, like the nightmare killer Freddy Krueger. After Jeffrey's injury, he received more donations from his fans. He even started selling autographs, but the other inmates didn't buy it. When Jeffrey realized that his autographs weren't selling well, he thought of another way to make money, selling close-up photos that his female fans sent him. This was a profitable business, and with the money he made, Jeffrey became even more unscrupulous. He even dared to play with other inmates' food in front of the guards. Finally, some inmate couldn't stand it anymore and warned Jeffrey to behave. Jeffrey tried to explain that he was only making some fun, but the inmate was still angry and said that the prison was a place for redemption, not for entertainment. The man's name was Scarver, and he was once the leader of a famous gang and had been sentenced to life imprisonment for his crime. Scarver wanted to find out Jeffrey's background, so he went to the prison library and asked the administrator about Jeffrey's origins, but the system showed that Scarver had a mental illness and couldn't be provided with others' information. Scarver explained that he had recovered from his illness and had become a devout believer. Eventually, the administrator gave Scarver all the recent news reports about Jeffrey. After reading everything, Scarver was shocked and angry. He couldn't believe that Jeffrey could even take the lives of children. When Jeffrey was cleaning, he saw the TV doing an interview with a serial killer who resembled him. It's said that this man lured victims into his home and then drugged and cruelly tortured them. He was none other than the notorious serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, whose crimes were even more serious than Jeffrey's. Gacy had killed 33 people, and his trial had lasted for 14 years before a verdict was finally reached. Two months later, Gacy was executed, becoming the first criminal to be executed in the area. But during the TV interview, Gacy showed no signs of depression or fear. As it turned out, he had joined the church 10 years earlier and had been repenting for many years. He had found his peace because he had reconciled with the Almighty and had received redemption. Jeffrey was deeply moved after watching the entire interview and immediately went to find the prison chaplain. He said that he had wanted to be a bad person since he was a child and had continued to do so as an adult, but now he had realized his mistakes and was even prepared to atone for them with his life. The chaplain told him that as long as one was sincere, forgiveness was possible. One month later, Jeffrey received his father's visit. This time, he was in a very good mental state and said that he was taking medication under the guidance of a doctor. The father was overjoyed and believed that his son would eventually return to the right path. Jeffrey said that he was about to be baptized and officially join the church. When his father heard this, he almost burst into tears. Time flew by, and this day was a special day when the execution of the serial killer Gacy was scheduled, and Jeffrey's baptism ceremony was also taking place. In a coincidence, there was also a solar eclipse at noon, and the earth was shrouded in dark red sunlight. The doctor allowed Gacy to make a final statement before he died. However, even when he was about to die, the killer still had a nonchalant attitude and said, just leave me alone. As the drug was administered, the killer John Wayne Gacy closed his eyes forever. On the other side, under the guidance of the priest, Jeffrey slowly descended into the baptismal pool. After a while, the baptismal ceremony was finally completed, and the priest came up to congratulate him, saying that he had been redeemed. Two extremely vicious murderers, one facing death and one gaining a new life, were like the day and night alternating. However, his inmate Scarer believed that a criminal with such heinous crimes like Jeffrey did not deserve to be redeemed. 
The next day, Jeffrey and his friend were cleaning the gym when Scarver also came in. The prison guard said it was his shift, and he came to help. At first, Jeffrey did not pay much attention, but when Scarver called his friend into the bathroom, he felt something was off. As expected, screams soon came from the bathroom. Jeffrey was about to go in to take a look, when Scarver came out with a bloody wooden stick, saying that the man had killed his wife and framed two black men and deserved to be punished. Then, Scarver began to recount Jeffrey's crimes, causing him to step back, saying that he had already received forgiveness from God. However, Scarver claimed that he was a messenger of punishment sent by God. Scarver delivered a heavy blow to Jeffrey, knocking him down, and then pulled out an iron bar, brutally swung it at Jeffrey's head, wanting him to experience the pain that the victims had gone through. After a while, Jeffrey lay motionless on the ground. After the incident, Scarver kept muttering to himself, and it was clear that his own mental illness had not been cured yet. After learning about the assault, Jeffrey's father rushed to the hospital. However, all he saw was the cold body of his son, as Jeffrey had already passed away. When the white cloth was lifted, he saw Jeffrey's face was caved in. His father collapsed onto the bed and wailed, unable to believe that his son, who had just started to turn his life around, had left this world. Two weeks later, Jeffrey's body was cremated, and the ashes were divided between his biological parents. To their surprise, Jeffrey's mother survived after her last suicide attempt. Now they face a bigger problem. Many scientists want to know if criminal behavior is related to the body itself. When Jeffrey's body was cremated, his brain tissue was preserved for further research. However, before scientists can slice and study the brain, they must obtain permission from Jeffrey's parents. Jeffrey's mother agreed to the study, hoping that it would shed light on why her son committed multiple murders, possibly due to his brain malfunctioning. On the other hand, Jeffrey's father strongly opposed the idea, insisting on cremating Jeffrey's brain as per his son's will, which stated that he did not want any funeral service but only to be cremated. The parents could not reach an agreement, so the matter was brought to court for hearing. Three months later in the courtroom, the judge ruled to cremate Jeffrey's brain. He believed that the factors influencing criminal behavior are complex and cannot be simply summarized as innate or acquired. If a person is judged to be a criminal from birth due to their brain structure, it will undoubtedly cause even more serious social problems. Therefore, studying the behavior of criminal brains should be prevented. At the end of this story, Glenda, the neighbor of Jeffrey, found the city commissioner for the seventh time. She had proposed to rebuild a memorial park for the victims on the site of the demolished apartment. At the time, the authorities said they would consider it, but months passed without any progress. Surprisingly, Glenda was so persistent that the commissioner had to tell her the truth. Many people didn't want to build anything on that land until everyone forgot about Jeffrey. Upon hearing this, Glenda was furious, saying that even if the building is torn down, what happened inside will not be erased. However, even after the release of the film, nothing had been built on that piece of land. To sum up, the drama spent a lot of time explaining the reasons for Jeffrey's pathological psychology formation, including innate factors such as Jeffrey's father passing on his delusional thoughts and drug use by Jeffrey's mother during pregnancy as well as acquired factors such as Jeffrey's father teaching him anatomy since childhood, his tendency to avoid problems, and the social environment causing police negligence and judicial bias. All these factors have all contributed to Jeffrey's path to criminality. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.